everybody. So, an eddy, it's really just a swirl of water. And you can get an eddy if you just put two streams of water against each other, they'll begin a circular motion. And of course, if it's strong enough, you get a whirlpool, but an eddy is just that swirling round of water. And it'll happen in anything that moves, including air. So you get eddies coming off the tips of wind turbines. And you can also get eddies in something like this. This is a lump of metal. I mean, in itself, it won't form an eddy because it can't flow. But the standard way of seeing a lump of metal is a group of metal ions held rigidly and all of the electrons in here form a C and they're free to flow around those rigid metal ions. And because they're free to flow, if we can get one flowing one way, another flowing another way, we will get an eddy, a swirl of those electrons in the actual metal itself. And we can do that. And we can do that actually really easily by using this. If we move a metal through a magnetic field, then the magnets cause the electrons to move and we get a flow of electrons or a current. If we move them the other way, of course, they flow the other way, but they're not free to flow. There's actually a rigid structure all around them. Remember those cations? And some of them will hit those cations, causing them to vibrate more. And that vibration is what we see as heat. So the faster we can do that, the more resistance there is because there's things in the way, the more the eddy currents form and the more heat we get. Now I can do that lots of different ways, but one way I can do it is with permanent magnets. If I take some permanent magnets in a north-south, north-south and move them across the surface of a metal, that resistance will build up and up and up until we get a heating effect. And there was quite a lot of videos on YouTube showing people boiling water by taking permanent magnets and moving them quickly across the surface of a metal. Of course, it doesn't have to be a permanent magnet that does that. An electromagnet will do just as well. The only thing that matters is that the magnetic field moves. That's why you've got to rotate permanent magnets, because you have to move the magnetic field. But of course, with an electromagnet, we can just turn it off and on, and that will move the field. And we don't have the inconvenience of spinning something heavy very, very quickly, because it must happen quickly. That motor was rotating at 4,000 RPM. And if we can turn off and on a magnetic field at that kind of speed, we'll get exactly the same result. And that is exactly what induction heating is. Now, an induction heater is actually only really four parts. A power supply, a coil, the workpiece, which is counted as part of an induction heater, and a switch that can turn it off and on quickly. But of course, switching that quickly means we can't really use a mechanical device. And so the switching is taken care of by electronics by a transistor. The transistor can switch to the speed that we want it to switch at, and so we can turn it off and on quickly. Now that's the basics of it, but of course everything carries caveats and there are ways to make it more efficient. And what's really normal is to put the coil in what's called a tank circuit. Now a tank circuit is a resonant circuit, and I'll talk about this in a different video, but you make it with a coil and a capacitor, and they're able to ring at a certain frequency, just like a tuning fork, and that makes them very much more efficient. So what you're doing is switching it off and on to pulse it with a little bit of power to get it to ring. Once it's in frequency, then it can actually transfer the power efficiently and heat up your workpiece. But that just really obscures what it is you're doing. All you're doing is turning that magnetic field off and on quickly. It's just that the additions make it more efficient or you'd lose a lot of power. And with induction heating, it's a lot of power, which is why you find this tank circuit there, because it makes it very much more efficient. And of course, zero voltage switching also makes it very much more efficient because the switches themselves are transistors. Actually, they're usually MOSFETs, but that's just a kind of transistor. And if you turn them on when the voltage isn't zero, you lose a lot of power. And so what they do is bring that voltage down to zero so that when it switches at zero, none of the power is lost. And that's the whole point of these additions to it. They make it much more efficient, but they're not at the core of what's happening. The core of what's happening is all you're doing is turning that magnetic field off and on quickly in the same way that we did it 
when we spun the magnets with the motor. Anyway, all that aside, they're actually pretty easy to build, and here's an awesome circuit for a very simple one that works really well. You might notice it is in fact a flyback circuit meant for driving high voltages, but that really doesn't matter. All it is, is an oscillator driving a tank circuit, and tank circuits are so important. They appear all over the place. Here in induction heating, we've seen them in Tesla coils, you'll see them in radios. They're absolutely everywhere and a very important circuit, but we can use this circuit to drive that oscillator as part of our induction heater, and all we do is remove the ferrite core and the high voltage coil side of things and our workpiece will go in that five turn five turn coil and will become the induction heater that we're making driven by that oscillator circuit again all we're doing is turning it off and on quickly this circuit is reasonably efficient for doing that job so here are the components used this is an irfp 150n mosfet and it's put onto the board using some very large heat sinks. So that will keep those nice and cool. Those will get hot. The IRFP 150N has a maximum tolerable voltage between the drain and the source of 100 volts. That means we can't use uh, input power more than something like 40 volts. That's because the way that the induction coil works with the back EMF causes the resonant voltage to be a lot higher than the supply voltage. It's approximately pi times the supply voltage. I've got a 24 volt supply, so you'd expect that to be something like 70 volts or so, something around that. And that's pretty close to this MOSFET. This gives us about a 30 volt tolerance. If you want to dry it with a higher voltage, you're going to need a bigger MOSFET. <laughs> Another important feature of the MOSFET is to make sure that you get along with a low on voltage resistance because you want it to look like a closed circuit with zero voltage so it doesn't heat up when it's on. The other components here are the diodes, there's two of them. They're switching diodes, the one that feed power supplies, and they feed the signal back to the inside of the work coil and switch it on and off. And in this case, I pulled these from a UPS, the DS145 5-08A. They've got a maximum reverse voltage of 800 volts and quite a high current. Oh, the MOSFETs can uh, have a 44 amp current going through them, so pretty beefy things. They're 12 volt Zeno diodes at 1 watt. The 10K resistors are 2 watt resistors and the 470 resistors here are 2 watt resistors. Now the capacitors are going to be switching as fast as your resonant circuit is fasting so it has to be able to tolerate high frequency switching or it will get hot. These are 850 volt capacitors designed for high switching and they're 1 microfarads each. Now these are 4 in series, they have a capacitance of quarter of a microfarad and that configuration is put back to back to give about approximately half a microfarad. This is the coil. I've turned it into a rectangular coil because there are other things I want to do with it, but it's still a coil and it has an inductance of around three microhenries. Now if you do the calculations, it's one over two pi to the square root of the inductance times the capacitance, and that gives us a frequency of about 136 kilohertz. Of course, it's going to be different in actual practice. I think it's about 175 kilohertz. Uh, it's probably because of errors in measuring the inductance and the capacitor. Of course, in reality, in the physical world, things tend not to behave in the same way that we think they might. So that's the tank circuit and the inductor, and of course, it needs a power supply. And the power supply is just pulled from some old PCs. They're 12 volts each, and they're put into a series configuration. That's a pretty hot piece of metal. You can see it glowing in the sink. <laughs> okay, let's try a teaspoon in there.
So there you go, how to build an induction heater, how it works and why it works. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.